So, Pat, thank you uh, for coming to the podcast. This is uh, the Kevin Polkey, The Journey, the podcast. And um, thank you for coming in today. Uh, Pat is the Director of Chemical Dependency Services at KP Counseling. And so I've been looking forward to having this conversation. We've known each other for a while. And I'm just looking to see, uh, uh, I want to interested in getting to know you a little bit even more than I've already know. And then uh, for people that are interested in knowing more about what we do regarding addiction services at KP, um, maybe you can help us out with that but um, but before we get started um, so I know you have a big family uh, lots of girls uh, in the house uh, but it, when you're not working which I know you do a ton of that um, but when you're not working what do you do for fun what do you do to, to relax what do you do for fun what do you do to get rejuvenated well thanks for having me on Kevin um, rejuvenation we're running a lot I've got four daughters are all in sports uh, multiple sports and so we're constantly seeing different activities and even on weekends that we don't have our own sports we seem to gather around other people and see how their sports go whether it be sure. basketball or volleyball we're in uh, basketball and volleyball season right now okay um, otherwise the family just gets away uh, sure. this year we've gone to Mackinac Island Michigan okay. Florida so we just try to get away and spend time together so we got a big family we got four Four girls, right? So four daughters. And once you, wife's name and then Kristen and is my wife, and we met in college. Um, we've been married 21 years now. Okay. And my oldest daughter is 18, and she'll graduate this year and go on to to whatever that looks like. Um, okay. <laughs> and then every two years in the fall, we had a daughter. So okay, Julia, Lauren, Kayla, Samantha. Okay. okay. Senior, sophomore. Eighth grade, sixth grade. Okay. They okay. all play volleyball. They all play basketball, minus one. Uh, they all play softball. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I'm pretty much. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure busy. you covered every month of the year yeah. with those seasons. Okay. All right. So, um, you, you and Christian met in college. Where Where was that at? What college did you go to? NIU playing volleyball. Okay. So she played. She played volleyball. Yeah, we just intramurals. But, oh, okay. Um, okay. Gotcha. All right. And so we're playing sand volleyball, and okay. I tried to be fancy and spike a ball, and she stuffed me. And yeah, and, and so it begins. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so so how did you, I mean, like I said earlier, you've been an addiction counselor for how long? 24 years this March. Okay. All right. And you've been with uh, KP, you've been with me for, I think we're going on three years now. Three I mean, years. like in a week or so. Yeah. And um, and so what, what led you to get into addiction work, being an addiction counselor, and now being the director of uh, chemical dependency services? So kind of a funny story. Um, I left high school to go be an engineer at NIU. And then uh, despite doing very well, I decided I want to work with people. And so left engineering with many people telling me, I was crazy. Um, went to psychology and sociology. I was going to be a cop for a number of years, and everything just kept kind of getting in the way. Okay. Uh, my first interview in the field, I was told I'd never make it, so find something else to do, kid. And uh, the interview lasted 10 minutes, and then they kind of kicked me out. Um, okay. And then I got a job at Rosecrans. Uh, I don't even remember sending an application there at that time. I okay. swear the guy stole it okay. off somebody else's desk and okay. hired me on. Okay. And it's been that way ever since. So, so when you first started at Rosecrans, what capacity was that? I mean, you had, had a, you had a four-year degree at that time. Four-year degree. Yeah. I started at the unit counselor level, so I was really in training. Okay. And so there were a lot of really gifted people there that I absorbed skills from. Sure. Okay. And, uh, and then it just kind of grew from there. Okay. When you think back to that time period, I mean, so that was 20 plus years ago. And what, when do you remember if, if there was a time or a moment, maybe not a specific day or anything, but a, a, a time period when you went, okay, I think this is what, this is the direction I really want to go in. I mean, when, when do you think, what, what would be when you got kind of that aha moment, this is where I'm supposed to be? I remember my uh, martial arts instructor at the time was um, was telling me that if you stay in a job about five to seven years, it's a career now. Okay. And I remember cruising along at about the three to four year mark, and I was like, no, nah, I'm going to go other places. This is just a start. And it just kind of kept growing on me. And so all of a sudden, I turned around, and I was the go-to person, and I was the, the quote, rising star, the person who got the promotions and, okay. and got the difficult uh, caseload. And, okay. the, and back then, it was adolescence. And so the ones that were struggling the most. Okay. Um, I seem to be able to reach him. Okay. 
uh, martial arts. So tell me about a little bit about your your story about martial arts and your history of martial arts. So how that how that all start? <laughs> so it starts as a young kid watching Black Belt Theater on Thursday nights. Um, sure, yeah. Well after bedtime. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of kept this little mystique growing in the background of this, uh, you know, kung fu, and mm -hmm. um, and so I find an instructor who's got this crazy lineage where he learned from a guy that was actually a monk, and and uh, and it was really amazing. That was a uh, kind of one of the big families in my life. Not that my family wasn't important, but uh, kind of a brotherhood that grew out of that. Okay. And so I was there. I think I ranked out at 16 years. Okay. Um, and you started that about how old were you? Do you think? I mean, when you actually met this met the your instructor 19 years old okay okay so you were done with high school yep. it just, just started, started college. college okay mm -hmm. and um, and you did that obviously all the way up into your 30s yeah okay yeah and, and thinking back about that so when you were in high school um, middle school and high school did you play sports then oh yeah I played everything basketball football I didn't do track um, baseball and then I picked up volleyball in college and then we started traveling uh, a traveling team in in my early 20s with my wife um, yeah um, watching my daughters go through their their sports I pulled out uh, the old uh, clippings from from newspapers to okay. to see the background and okay. um, it's funny how much my memory shifted offline, so it's good to get it back. To, okay. Because now I'm running into players that I've played against who okay. remember me, which okay. strikes me odd because I wasn't a superstar. I was just kind of that that workhorse in the background. Okay. And then where uh, where was high school? Where did you go to high school? So Franklin Grove is between Dixon and Rochelle. It's very small. Okay. And my sophomore year, we started to combine with Ashton. We were so small. Okay. So football was a combine, and basketball was separate and a strong rivalry with the school you just played football next to okay okay sure okay so um, so then when you now how common was martial arts I mean in that area it was, didn't exist it didn't exist okay my cousin uh, was back and forth between his father's house and mother's house and so North Carolina so he he absorbed some of it and brought it into my small world other than through the television and it was interesting to see it in a human sense and okay. then uh, it just kind of took off in college okay and if you think back uh, with the martial arts, because um, that's just interesting. You know, it's 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 unique. There's not a lot of individuals, um, and I don't know how many addiction counselors have a back backstory of, of martial arts. So, what would you say going through? Uh, you would you say 19 years? Did you say? Well, I ranked out at 16. I probably oh, 16. practiced 13. Oh, okay, okay. And so, what um, what were some of those lessons that you think you learned, maybe specifically from from that activity, from the from that journey when you were actively participating in that? Um, what would we say now when you look back on that those were some um, life lessons that uh, played a part in the work that you do with addiction now so I like to use a lot of analogies okay, um, I sure. steal a lot of analogies from movies from martial arts uh, Harry Potter books whatever um, and one of the things that I talk about is the idea of how we overcome stressful situations mm -hmm. uh, we, we practice all these these techniques and we we logically go through how to deal with these things but the truth is is when fight or flight kicks in you're left with what you train mm -hmm. and so uh, what I've learned is through the years is that the training exists it's still there um, <laughs> there's a lot of funny stories of where people have surprised me and got a bad result because I just kind of respond I don't think first or, or realize and, um, and they learn not to do that again but um, but the thing that that kind of showed me was the idea that you're not just going to think your way through everything in life. You really have to practice on a mm -hmm. constant basis. And so if you're going to work recovery, what are you going to do every day to make that change? Mm -hmm. If you're going to practice martial arts, what are you going to do every day to make sure that you're embedding it into a part of your life and not just carrying it around like uh, an accessory, but making it a part of you. Okay. Um, and so through the years, there are times that are up and down, but you stay consistent. You get back up. You keep moving. You win. You lose. You keep moving. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just about one competition or one engagement or one win. It's about a constant way of living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that idea about a way way of living. So I'm interested in, in that. The combination of being a competitive athlete, combination of some things didn't work out that you thought were or, or maybe doors got closed, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think, uh, and, then, and then this, you know, when you first started working in the addiction field, Field. 
obviously you had that work ethic. It, it just sounds like that was just part of it. And then doors started opening as, as you were, you know, continuing on that journey and um, opportunities started coming. There was different people that were helping you out in that process. Uh, the, the idea of, you were talking about lifestyle. How do, how do you, if you look back now, as you were growing that career and obviously growing a family as well, at the same time, how would you say that some of that, some of the stuff you did individually, because you were still, during those first years at Rosecrans, you were training. Mm -hmm. um, um, so how would you say more from a lifestyle um, that you noticed personally as you were going through that? Hmm. Um, especially with the counseling portion, learning how I deal with people and how I talk to people. Okay. Uh, it's kind of forged some things now through to, to even to today where I still naturally do things. Um, I'm not the kind of person that's going to tell you the correction that you need. I'm, I'm not going to tell you the mistake you're making. I'm going to focus on the correction you make. Um, okay. It's it's something that I actually developed out of uh, coaching, whether it be sports or martial arts, where if you tell someone the mistake, that's all they fixate on. Okay. And as they focus on not doing the mistake, they continue the mistake, mm -hmm. almost as a, <laughs> um, a, a Freudian slip, if you will. It's a way that if you fixate on what not to do, your body doesn't know about the don't do it. It just does it. And so we focus on the correction. What are you going to do about it? Where are you going to go from here? Um, one of the things that I don't dwell a lot on <laughs> most of the time are the mistakes. Sure. And um, I try to take the learning lesson, cast the mistake away, and move forward. Mm -hmm. That way it's perfect. But, sure, sure. Um, what else did you ask? <laughs> no, it was just it was just about that and how either either with martial arts or with with coaching or, or competitive sports yourself, how did that play a part? And then when as you're you know either working with other your, your peers or working with people above you, you know in management wise or working with the clients, how has that played out? Because I guess the part where I'm thinking is is that I know for me I just made this comment to someone last week. I was back at one of the school districts. I used to be the strength conditioning coach, and I said um, I never gave them a workout that I hadn't done myself first, and because I, for me, I didn't believe I could teach how to do an exercise, how to use a piece of equipment if I hadn't already been utilizing that piece of equipment. Um, I don't know if it was uh, an integrity thing. I don't know if it, was, but for me, it just felt like I couldn't with, I just couldn't teach the. The, the nuances of of the movement if I hadn't actually done the movement myself mm -hmm. and so that's what it just reminded me of uh, yeah I can relate to that where it's kind of a kinetic learning thing once I've done it once I've seen it once I've played with it I can then show others and then pick up the subtleties and break it down to where other people might miss small key pieces mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure all martial arts are this way but when you look at kung fu there are such small intricacies in the movement that if you do it wrong uh, you're going to pay later, um, whether it be your knees at the wrong angle and all of a sudden your hip is inflamed two years down the road, or um, whether you keep your arms slightly bent when blocking and that way you don't break your arm on accident. Little subtle nuances that you don't realize in the beginning. Uh, and so we used to say that mastery is forged in the beginning, not the end. You master from the beginning. It isn't that you learn a thousand moves and practice them, it's that you learn one, master it, move on. And that way, um, it becomes ingrained, like we talked about, as a natural response, but it also becomes that work ethic, and it also ties into a daily way of living. Mm -hmm. Work the basics, keep moving forward, let the mistakes go, and learn. Mm -hmm. So, moving into the idea of recovery, right? So, so for um, you know, that, I got introduced to uh, addiction work in the early '90s when I was working actually at Oakwood Hospital at the time, um, and this was I think '91, '92, and. And um, in that, I um, I remember that was first introduced for me. It was men's work. Um, that was a big thing that I got involved with men's psychology work through um, Rafa Memorial at that time, ATEP, mm -hmm. and doing um, weekend retreats and, and those things. And um, then it got introduced. This idea of recovery um, would be the um, the antidote to addiction, and and that was different than just being sober. But it, it really embraced that whole clean and sober lifestyle. 
And um, so t- tell me, like, because your back, it doesn't sound like your background was your own personal, coming out of your own personal use and right. then going and getting clean that way. It, you started off at being a job and then something happened because you've been doing it for so long. You're well known in the community for what you do um, um, regarding addiction work. Um, so, yeah, tell me when, when you knew specifically with addiction work, not just other forms of behavioral health that, that seem to be, um, that's going to be my niche. When I started at Rosecrans in 95, um, I picked it up really quick and it, it was kind of a job. Um, and I remember my boss, uh, Joel Sharp, he took me on a retreat up to the Boundary Waters. We took four adolescents up there. Um, it was when Canada was on fire and the United States had put their side of the fire out and the Canadians were kind of saying, let it burn. So we're up in the Boundary Waters, miles from these uh, flames illuminating the skyline. And we spent a week up there where my boss tied everything we did to recovery. It was insane how everything we did, he tied in, the smallest of things. And in the beginning, um, it was almost like, all right, come on, that's a stretch. But he started to kind of impress the idea that this is a way of living. This isn't just about um, not using, as we talked about. That recovery becomes a part of life, that it becomes um, more than just not screwing up. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know where it kind of clicked in place, but that was definitely one of the anchor points that that helped me to realize that there was a lot of area to grow. Um, you know, going back to the martial arts, it, it, you learn the move, but then you keep learning and you keep learning and there's a depth to it. Mm-hmm. Um, we used to take clients to meetings all the time. And so I remember a meeting where a guy named Blair started talking about step one. And this guy's got 32 years sober and he says, you know, I figured something out about step one I didn't realize before and I'm like what are you talking about it's a sentence 32 years and you have not figured it all out and that's when it started kind of coming in as there's a depth there's an ongoing growth you're never going to reach the finish line okay um and from there just kind of embedding myself in the stories of others and and kind of realizing that I could help okay so so similar to the lifestyle of being a competitive athlete similar to the lifestyle that you learned from from your instructor with with martial arts recovery is, is that lifestyle it's not just an activity that you take on for a certain time period until you're feeling better mm-hmm. it, it's for the ones that really grasp it and benefit the most from it is when they when they own it when they uh, take on that lifestyle Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about um, uh, what you've what you've uh, observed over time. You know, um, I know for me, being a counselor as long as I've been, there's certain um, scenarios that stand out for me. You know, and then that uh, of someone getting it and owning it and grasping it, and then there's other times where I just see they don't. They fight it and they struggle in, in that piece. Uh, anything in particular stand out to you regarding someone that you? You, you may think not not any names or anything, yeah. but that uh, any stories that stand out to you of of someone who maybe struggled and really fought it, and then at some point surrendered. Um, and it, 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 you know, a lot of times with addiction, right? They or anything, you know, we come in because something isn't going well, right? And but it's that surrendering to self, not necessarily surrendering to someone else, but that surrendering to my old way of looking at it or myself. Um, anything in particular stands out when you think of uh, think of any of those? I could probably talk on that for hours. Um, it's interesting, the, the inner weavings. And so, uh, you know, in martial arts class, we'd see guys come in after they got in a fight and they wanted to learn how to defend themselves. And I kind of quibbed that a little bit late on that one, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you'd see them transform over time to wanting revenge to kind of getting it. When you look at the program, you'll see a lot of people come in because something bad has happened. I don't care why someone comes in. I don't care if it's because someone told them they had to or because they felt a calling. It's where do they go from there? Are they going to grow their internal reasons in addition to the external reasons, even when probation or work or a spouse is no longer demanding that they be involved? And so the individuals that you see that kind of get it, uh, in my experience, have some common qualities. The first thing is they're going to let it in. 
Um, and I'm a feelings guy, so I'm always looking for the people who have the feelings. They don't have to cry, but uh, you can tell that they experience. First, it's usually the remorse, and then we grow from there. Um, and then we have to overcome beating ourselves up in most cases, because once you experience that, then you attack your character. Um, the idea of hope sets in. You start to realize that others can help, and you don't have to fight this by yourself. And so whenever I see somebody that doesn't have a system that's in place or being developed that will support them, I get leery because there's going to be a time when they're alone and then what will they do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the faster they embrace it, the more they let others help, the more they can kind of grow from others. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's always been a billboard program. Uh, if you if you want what we got, come and get it. Sure. And so um, whether you're finding a sponsor, whether you're finding a meeting, finding someone that you want what they got and then go about claiming it for yourself through the work. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you said, um, how did you get it? I'm going to show you how I got it. Now you can do it. Right, right. Well, and going back to the martial arts, I mean, you um, being up way past your bedtime on a Thursday night, <laughs> you were drawn to, you were attracted uh, to that mystique, maybe because it stood out, it was different, it was unique than what else was going around um, mm -hmm. with other guys your age at that time period, or just um, there was something about it that you were drawn to. So maybe similar to like when we talk to someone who's looking for a sponsor, um, what is it that you're drawn to? You know, um, and I know we have some some guidelines regarding that. You know, uh, want want someone to be of the same sex. Um, you know, have so many years of, of recovery, mm -hmm. and um, and I think those are all important um, in, important elements. Not that we can't learn from someone else, but I know for me, uh, doing a lot of work for, uh, for over twenty years in uh, gender specific work, um, doing the men's psychology work. That I know in my story, not. Um, uh, connecting with someone, uh, learning from someone, um, learning to let my guard down with someone of the same sex, with another man, um, that took a greater level of vulnerability to do that than um, than it did with with a woman, uh, it, because I could, I felt it felt it was easier to go there. But then the boundaries were all skewed because of, right. of that sexual tension or whatever may be, if not on my part, maybe the other way, mm -hmm. because you're dealing with those kind of emotions, that, that, that rawness. But to do that with another man and know that that could be at real risk, mm -hmm. what are they going to do with that? Are they going to hold that space? Um, I remember that first experiencing that um, and, and, or, or observing that. And, and through that observation, experiencing it, going, really, that's how you can do that? And that was the beginning um, of seeing the power of what you can do in groups. And, um, and and we've talked about, you and I individually have talked about this idea of group work and the benefits of, of doing, um, doing groups. And you run the intensive outpatient program and the outpatient program at, at KP. Tell me a little bit about what draws you into group. What's the, um, what are some of the benefits that you see when someone participates in a, in, a, in a treatment group or a therapy group, um, well, and I guess you could say as well as AA, but uh, a support group, but specifically with a therapy group, what do you see as some of the benefit um, opportunity for growth there that may not come in an individual basis? It's funny. Looking back, I always uh, identified myself as an inpatient counselor, and so that's what I did with the adolescents for five years and then um, with adults all the way up until uh, I can't remember when it was, but I was out, I was outpatient for six years at Rosecrans, and that's where I started to understand the difference between what I'll call frontline groups and um, kind of your residential groups, because in outpatient, the clients are going home. They're in harm's way. Sometimes they're coming in in harm's way, mm -hmm. um, whether that be in a trauma or under the influence or whatever. They could be walking in in an unstable state. Um, but what I really started to realize was the idea of how groups differ. And so um, the intensive outpatient group uh, or the outpatient group, whichever, is, is an interesting dynamic because you've got a lot of different personalities and a lot of different backgrounds, but you hopefully have similar goals in mind. And so, um, you know, you always started off with an individual session to build rapport. So if they trust you, then maybe they trust the process that you're running. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something I've always done is when you walk into group, unless you know groups and have been in them, you're going to be a ghost. We're going to ignore you. We're going to introduce ourselves, and then you're going to sit there and we're going to ignore you. Uh, see how we work because. 
I might sell how group works a certain way, but I want you to see it, I want you to buy into it, and it kind of grows on those that are involved. And so they become the promotion of how things are working. As individuals start to dig deeper, they start to show that it's a safe place to go, and then newer members will follow. Um, we just had it last week where uh, the second half of our intensive outpatient group just ran deep, and we started talking about difficult topics and getting past the mask and loss and and you watched as each member just slowly invested mm -hmm. and continued to go a little bit deeper because your group will only go as deep as your as your most least safe client i guess mm -hmm. um, but the idea of groups have always been about the group and once you know as a new counselor it was all about me because i was so wise and powerful <laughs> and sure um, learning to step aside and let the process run and get out of the way and just knock down the barriers when they pop up mm -hmm. um, that's when you'll see a group that's in a rhythm um, the rule of thumb is the more i talk the more educational the group is mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, if i can run groups by a head nod or a raised eyebrow or a gesture to keep the flow of the process then i will because then the group owns it and they'll take it where it needs to go and I just kind of do bumper bowling at that point and keep it out of the gutters. Sure, sure. So, um, so when you think of what you're doing now, and and as we've talked, you know, it's a you're an evolving entity, not only with as in your family, as as your girls get older, as you as, as you have more experience parenting them, and, and your marriage continues to grow, um, but then also as a counselor, you know, three years ago you you left an organization that you had been with for 20, 20 plus years yeah. and and I know that was a that was in itself was a journey and 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 that experience and so um, t tell me a little tell us a little bit about that part because I mean you're an extremely loyal person and and since I've known you I've known knew that about you when you worked at Rosecrans and 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 so tell me about some of that element of the journey um, of, of of what that was like for you individually um, as you may a major change. I mean, your kids are all of them were in school, um, grade school, middle school, and high school at the time, um, and, and you're making this major move. And and there's financial risk. There is, I, I guess, career risk. I mean, there was a lot of things going on. What was that? Um, what was that journey like? So for me, I've always known that when I feel like I'm swimming against the current, there's probably something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, when I was trying to get into law enforcement and I kept swimming against the current, it just wasn't working. When I tried to stay in engineering, it just wasn't working. And once I kind of um, accepted the path that I was supposed to be on, it, it seemed to click. Um, getting into Rosecrans was that way. It just kind of clicked. It's like, where did mm -hmm. this job come from? And, and all of a sudden, I'm off and running and, and growing. and. Um, uh, I did direct service for 15 years, straight counseling, whether it be inpatient or outpatient, did trainings, uh, went places and trained other people, seminars, um, built programs. When I, the last five years I was a manager, and yeah, I don't know if I was a good manager or not, some people say yes, some people say no, but it wasn't my wheelhouse, and it ex expended a lot of my resources to be able to do that. Um, especially with my kids getting older, it was time to focus on being around for them, whether it be the sporting events, whether it be coaching, whether it be being home at night, and uh, and the hours got very extreme. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a vacation we were going to go on, but we were all just too tired to go to Disney. How often do people say that? And so we uh, we went on a trip to our uh, Lutheran camp, and everything just kind of cleared up, and everything landed in place. And then uh, I don't I don't move quickly. I, I'm kind of like a sniper. I just sit and watch and wait for the shot. But uh, I made this move to KP pretty quick. It felt right, and so I figured I would uh, stop swimming up the current mm -hmm. and start moving where I was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and get back into direct care because that's my wheelhouse. Right. It's it's effortless for me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there's not bad days, but right. it's uh, it replenishes me a lot more than than the managing position did. Sure. 
And I know that was part of the key. You know, at the time, it had less to do with one organization being better or worse than the other. It had to do with um, it, it wasn't really not that you didn't have skill at it, and I did, you definitely have skill at that management position. Um, but it, it, at some point, if we're not working within our gifts and um, we're not in that flow, then it takes more energy than we're getting mm -hmm. from it, and it, and it doesn't have that reinforcing loop. Yeah. And I know that was one of the things that you emphasized um, with me at the very beginning when we first started talking. When you came to now, you know, you were still the director of, even though um, there's an element of what management you have to do mm -hmm. um, with that, but you're really um, a clinician. That's your primary you yeah. know, function at KP is the clinician because you're seeing you're seeing the clients. Um, you have your own caseload. You 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 know, two out of the three nights of of, of group, you're running the groups. Um, what as you as you see with this this group, and if there's someone who is intrigued by a group, or maybe someone who's struggling with addiction, who's listening, um, what would you say? What would you want people to know about um, if they came, if they were looking at um, this idea of getting sober, you know, and they know that it, they have to, uh, that it's done. They just don't know what's next, mm -hmm. you know. They and and there's fear. I know for me, in <clears throat> when I was making that ch transition. I knew that I'd stayed too long, kind of like what you just said. Um, but my fear of who would I be and what would happen um, if I stopped doing what I was doing, um, that paralyzed me, and I just continued doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was almost like, what would they say, the, the, the fear of an unknown was greater than the fear of staying. Yeah, and, and the pain of staying. Yeah. You know, and so I was willing to take that continued risk you know, with that. So, what would you say as, as you've created this program? Um, um, you have a lot of autonomy on how you how you run the program. What would you say that? Um, what would be that that billboard, that attraction piece, if you were going to send something out to somebody? Uh, I know for me it was that tipping point, and like you said, staying too long and um, and, and kind of fighting uphill to to stay in a place that wasn't wasn't where I needed to be, whether it be emotional, whether it be physical, whatever. Uh, when someone's getting into recovery, there's usually been some kind of pain, some kind of a external or internal shock. And um, a lot of times the window opens to the opportunity of change. And then sometimes we will uh, just wait slowly until it closes and say, well, I missed that opportunity. Anybody can get into counseling. Uh, everybody talks about a rock bottom, but they never talk about the fact that rock bottom is hindsight. If you talk to me about a rock bottom yesterday, I'm not really going to listen to that too much. We'll talk about the situation, but rock bottom comes months down the road when that situation made a course correction. That's how you know it was a rock bottom. <laughs> um, I would say to anybody, give me a call and we can talk about what it's like. Come in, check it out. If you don't like it, that's mm -hmm. fine. Sure. But at least you get the ball rolling, you know what the options are. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of people that come in and say they've had prior groups that they didn't like or or they didn't like 12-step meetings. Okay, that's fine. Um, one of the benefits that I have is I've had a lot of groups um, that I've run. And so I've been able to take the things that work and toss out the things that don't. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are still some people that aren't ready, and that's fine. But it doesn't have to be uh, a personal failing. It doesn't have to be, uh, well, you're not ready yet. Uh, we each determine our readiness of our journey. Mm -hmm. And so when people have had consequences because of their use and they're not acting, then my question is always, what consequence are you willing to sign off on then mm -hmm. before you're ready to act? How far will you let it go before you then do something about it? Mm -hmm. And it's not a guilt trip. It's it's just a question to think about. Right. Whether be someone who's dieting or someone who's exercising or not or someone who is living in a way they know they shouldn't mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when we're honest with ourselves we know mm -hmm. and then it's really what are we ready to do about it right right you know, I think of, um, and and this is me. You know, uh, having having known some some of the clients that have gone through, and um, and something you just said, I, I think of. Um, we're doing a lot of work and a lot of communication on this podcast about Joseph Campbell's work of the hero's journey, mm -hmm. and and how that the transformation that happens during that time period, and um, and kind of like what you just said, we 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 get some type of, we know that we may be staying too long. 
along. We know that things are getting too hard. And and I think one of the things that can happen in a group setting can happen when you start that, first it starts the journey of um, sobriety contemplating sobriety and, and and or or knowing you need to but then making that cross over that threshold and and I, I think what what happens in your groups are is an initiation process this initiation into um, this new lifestyle into this new way of doing um, living and, and recovery and yes there are um, certain people that'll guide maybe <clears throat> maybe it'll be you maybe it'll be Jenny the other counselor maybe Maybe it'll be the sponsor. Maybe it'll be a combination of those things. But then there's helpers. But inevitably, there's dragons and demons to face. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the things that I appreciate so much that, of what you do and what you guys are doing in that group setting is that um, it's where um, the work can be done so the transform- transformation can happen. Um, I remember being in, doing addiction work, and I remember thinking that the alcohol or the drugs or whatever it was was only the symptom. It wasn't really the problem. It, it, it was the thing that had to be addressed, had to be arrested, um, contained, but typically it wasn't really um, where the fire was. It was, the, it was the smoke. But if we can never get to put the fire out, if we can't right. you know, decrease that smoke. And, um, and so uh, I think that's a big piece of what I see um, you guys doing in the, in the, in the group is, is providing that opportunity um, for individuals to um, at least be begin the, the initiation process um, and do it in a way that um, they can get support and get some guidance. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, they're going to have to do that journey on their own, similar to martial arts, similar to wrestling or volleyball, whatever the sport may be. So, so Pat, if you, as we get ready to kind of wrap up for today, if there was anything that you um, wanted people to know about um, recovery, about the lifestyle of recovery, about the groups that you run, or about, you know, both what would, what would be a message that you would want to kind of have people to, to as a takeaway? Hmm. How to summarize all that? Um, when when you were talking about the idea of transformation, mm-hmm. uh, when you're talking about the idea of working beyond just being sober, one of the reasons outpatient lasts so long is because it takes time to get to that level to get the fire out. Um, you don't go digging around in a house while it's still a smoldering mess. It's mm-hmm. dangerous. Um, and so working beyond putting the fire out, whatever the crisis was that brought somebody in, you know, uh, doctor, doctor hurts when I do this, don't do that. You know, trying to get beyond that concept, uh, whether it be done in individuals or groups, what you start to see is the group grow together. Mm-hmm. And so when a group is clicking, it's when the group is that support system. They are welcoming the new individuals because they remember when they were new. And you start to see the transference. You start to see other people that are little representatives of you and your past or of family members. Mm-hmm. And so when a group, you can start working on relationships with others in a very real way without suffering the consequence of having said something hurtful to a loved one. Mm-hmm. Group members will shake it off or your loved one might remember it forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea of transforming beyond just recovery uh, well, that's kind of what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, a lot of people come in and they want to find what caused it. Mm-hmm. Nine times out of ten, it's irrelevant. Uh, there are some clients that come in that it's so clear as a bell that I tell them what caused it. And I say, okay, you fixed now? No. Okay, well, what are we going to do about that? Mm-hmm. Where do we go from here? Too many people want to try and figure things out. And at the end of the day, it's really about feeling. Mm-hmm. And it's about learning. And it's about applying. Knowledge is not enough. And if it was, I'd just give you a worksheet and give you a little certificate and a little warranty and off you'd go. Right. Right. Um, the big thing to take away is that others have been here. And while it may, might be brand new for you, there are many other people that it's an everyday thing for that might be able to help out if you just take that leap. If mm-hmm. you just give it the opportunity for change. Sure. Or life will throw you another situation right. if you miss this window of opportunity. Well, 
Well, I definitely think it is, uh, you know, the, that parallel. You know, I think as I listen to you, uh, you know, remind me of your journey and your story of um, the background with competitive athlete, athleticism, uh, the martial arts attracted to that lifestyle. Um, that was all this foreshadowing of, and also at the time when your career, when you were practicing yourself, individually practicing your own um, discipline and uh, how that must have uh, really was ingrained um, in the work that you were doing as a, as a young counselor. And, um, and I'm very appreciative that you're able to take those gifts and skills and bring them uh, to KP and be able to um, run the group and invite people into um, the opportunity for that transformation and that initiation as well. So, well, thank you very much for coming on. And um, I think uh, we got a couple individuals that will be coming up in the next um, next few weeks that um, have actually gone through their journey and and have uh, themselves now uh, gone through that process of uh, actively using uh, to being sober. And um, we're going to emphasize some of their, uh, their stories and some of the things that they learned. And so maybe um, after we interview a couple of them, have some conversations with them, uh, maybe I'll have you come back on and um, tell you after you listen to those guys' stories maybe to see what you think and um, what, what you could add to that. But Pat, thank you very, very much for coming on and uh, we'll, we'll see you later. Thank you, Kevin. Yep.